Okay, kiddos, let's start. So this session, we're looking at chapters 6, 7, 8 and 9 of Stasi Land. Have your highlighters ready, have your annotation notes ready because we're going to track through these chapters and hopefully make sense of this week's reading for you. Remember your themes are totalitarianism and control, interrogation and torture, propaganda and history, surveillance and informers, courage and resistance, love and connection. Um, you've also got your characters, uh, your victims and your perpetrators. So remember you're taking notes on themes and you're also taking some notes on characters. So there's a couple of starting directions for you. Next, what you also need to be aware of is that we're going to encounter some language that is um, to be added to your vocab list. So um, you'll see a lot of German references and terms. I'm not sure how into that language you want to get. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you don't particularly need to um, hone in on a lot of the, the German references. Um, there'll be some, obviously, like the Runde Eck that are important, um, but a lot of the stuff is up to you. Rightio, so just a bit of context, we're looking at Stasi HQ here. So just uh, thinking about the progression of the text, we've had Miriam um, receive a letter from a German Argentinian or a German living in Arge Argentina who is interested in the puzzle women, the Nuremberg puzzle women, who put back together the pieces of information that the Stasi attempted to destroy um, about the, the German people in general. So um, she becomes interested in these personal stories and that's, that's your quote from earlier on, these personal stories because they form the collective history of the people of the GDR and she starts to become quite fascinated by these stories in her role as an agony aunt and a, a researcher um, for this um, radio company. So that's the impetus for um, actually putting out there, and this um, precedes chapter six, putting out there um, an advertisement um, asking for former collaborators, Stasi collaborators and informers, to notify her with discretion assured. So um, interestingly enough, once she puts that um, advertisement out in the Postam paper, she receives a heap of phone calls. And we've got here a reference to the moral quandary that now plagues Anna as she acknowledges that by entertaining the idea of um, hearing the stories of these collaborators, um, she is in fact contributing to um, their um, profiting of um, their business. So she kind of has a bit of a moral quandary about that. And yet, interestingly, I'm reading back over this again and I'm thinking, but she deliberately put the advertisement out there asking specifically for the stories of collaborators. So um, what she finds is that she's sort of conflicted now in terms of her purpose. So she gets sick of all these phone calls and you can see there's references to one of these phone calls at the start of chapter six. So she kind of gets sick of these phone calls and ends up um, taking a visit to the main Stasi headquarters in Berlin. So she kind of wants to get her mind away from these phone calls and, and I think um, the sense of um, confusion she feels now at having unleashed um, something that is almost beyond her control. She's not quite sure what to do with all this information. So um, her answer is to go to the um, ex Stasi HQ in um, Berlin. So from here, we get a chapter that deals with um, the history of the main bigwigs in the party um, in um, yeah the GDR. So we'll move on a little bit to um, chapter, like the first couple of pages in chapter six 
I think we are on page 69, it says. Um, I'm not sure how that compares with your book. Um, it's not in alignment with my book either. So you're going to have to try and navigate your way, um, your way through this. So I might just go back to the puzzle women to start with. No, that's in the earlier chapter. Sorry, bear with me. Um, okay. Right, so she makes her way to the museum. Okay, so here we go. We've got references um, to the surveillance state. So uh, there's an important acknowledgement of the historical facts of East Germany. Um, so I think this information is really important um, in terms of documenting historically the way that um, the Stasi um, worked in terms of its um, surveillance. So you can highlight this under surveillance state. Um, surveillance and even totalitarianism and control. Um, just up a bit, we've got the reference to Milke. So he is the uh, main bigwig in terms of um, the um, Stasi, what is his official title? Um, Minister for State Security. Okay, so you might, might want to add that to your um, description of Milke. Um, that he is the uh, um, head of state security. Um, and he's more than a figurehead. He, um, during the entire reign of the GE um, of, of the party here, um, he, he is the head. So there's him and Honecker. So they're going to be important um, references in, in this chapter and in the next chapter as well. Okay, so we've got... A reference on the next page to um, the ratio of informers um, to um, people in the GDR. So there's some really good information there that you can use down the track with your comparison um, and you can make reference to the uh, reality that potentially there was one informer for every 6.5 citizens in the GDR. So that's pretty scary. Um, Okay, so we've got um, more references here to the museum and as um, Anna makes her way um, through the tour, um, she makes certain observations um, about what's contained in the museum. So she gives us a combination of um, factual details as well as her own kind of sensory experiences of um, looking at photos. We've got physical um, descriptions of Milka there. Um, then we've also got some biographical information about the man um, that kind of just establishes his um, history um, and how he came to power. So I don't need to go into much detail about that, but just know that this chapter kind of um, provides that background information. Um, again, I think she's struggling with the personal stories of um, the collaborators um, and those phone calls that she's receiving. So she goes to the museum and she kind of does a little bit of research around um, the, the party leaders. So she finds out some other stuff as well. So if we move on, um, we see that there's a reference now to Honecker, so who's the leader of the party. And um, I think this contrast is nice. This reference to Milka being an invisible man, um, but Honecker um, being very visible. So um, when you're comparing the two texts, you might make some references to Honecker's um, status as uh, somebody who was everywhere. So the reference to him being in schools, free German youth halls, theatres and swimming pools, universities and police stations, etc., is reminiscent of the presence of Big Brother as well. So we've got Milka as invisible and Honecka as visible. And no surprise there because we've got Honecka as a leader and then Milka as the Minister for State Security and, and the Stasi 
by um, nature was an organisation that was very secretive. So um, we've got the two leaders um, talked about there. Okay, so if we move on, um, she comes back to the museum and a description of the museum and what it looks like. Then she goes on to um, look at the belief systems of these two men and um, their rationale for um, taking on board their philosophical thinking about um, socialism. So she makes reference to their um, focus on the evil of Nazism and then how both the leaders direct their um, attention to the West, um, which becomes the enemy. Uh, we've got a reference to the Soviet satellite state as well, um, which establishes um, the divide between East and West. Uh, then we move to historically tracking the move towards democracy. So in terms of tracking the history of the GDR, this chapter kind of starts with the, um, an examination of Honecker and Milka and um, the origins of their kind of um, uh, political ascendancy. And then it looks at their fall or the gradual move to a different system of government. And um, what we've got here is a reference to Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the Soviet Union uh, leader back in 1985. So he replaced Nikita Khrushchev and he was far more forward thinking in terms of um, trying to establish some uh, friendly links um, with the West. And his um, approach came to be known as Glasnost. So I've got some references there, historical references to the, the shift that happened in the 80s as uh, Russia um, became a lot more open in its um, willingness to negotiate and to open up ties with the West. So that becomes important. So thematically, if you want to look at totalitarianism and control, you've got this kind of push and Russia has a very influential role in shaping the thinking of the East Germans. Yet what you've got here is you've got resistance from these old men and there's lots of references to the age of these men. Um, and that's important, I think, in terms of the way that Funder attempts to contrast new ideas with the old ideas. And she, in the end, sets Honecker and Milka up as these kind of farcical relics of some kind of past legacy. Um, they are almost pathetically set up as caricatures, as laughable, which I think is interesting. So here you've got a reference to the new reforms that were being implemented and, and the fact that people ended up embracing these new ideas and this shift towards um, a, a more open and um, free um, way of thinking. Um, and yet these men clearly were uninclined to take on board that new thinking. So we've got that going on, which I think is interesting if you want to highlight uh, in regards to totalitarianism and control, the refusal of some people to accept new realities. Um, we'll get that in Big Brother as well, um, that there is no chance that Oceania will ever embrace a new way of thinking. And that's because that country is completely closed. Uh, effectively, there is no opportunity for any kind of public demonstration of opposition. We get Winston in his own private way denouncing Big Brother and we get Winston intuitively thinking that perhaps O'Brien is with him and then Julia, but his attempt at trying to find the brotherhood or trying to um, find um, an opposition party 
that will enable him to mobilise collectively with the opposition or with a counter-revolutionary movement is um, not there. Okay, so we've got the seeds of change documented here in a very historical and factual manner um, that points to the fact that East Germany does fall, that the Berlin Wall does fall. That doesn't happen in Big Brother in 1984. Okay, um, so we've got a little bit more history here. You can see the reference to dates, etc. Um, detail, um, the progression and the almost inevitability of change. So you've got this reference to people being infected with new ideas. So get your highlighters out and be prepared to note courage and resistance as a key theme in this chapter. So um, for me it's also interesting that we've got lots of allusions to um, the collective display of opposition with the demonstrations that occurred particularly in Leipzig and there's references to photos on the museum wall that um, show the demonstrators um, um, railing against the ossified um, men of the GDR. So that contrasted with the individual acts of courage I think is important because in 1984 we've only got those individual um, acts of courage. There, there isn't that global collective movement to denounce the system. That's what Winston's looking for. He's searching for evidence of the existence of the Brotherhood, but he fails to find what he's looking for. Here with these demonstrators, we've got evidence that um, a denunciation of the old ways of the GDR is manifest in that collective outpouring of um, protest. Okay, so that's a nice comparative focus and clearly in terms of um, your um, highlighting of themes, we've got courage and resistance there, the collective versus the individual. Um, okay, we've, we've also got again the, the resistance of the ossified men of the GDR to anything um, new. So uh, that reinforces that whole sense of um, tragicomical um, element to the depiction of these men, which I'd also add is quite biased. So you may want to look at the fact that Funder deliberately sets Honecker and Milka up as farcical characters who seem unthreatening um, post the fall of the GDR, they end up being prosecuted, they end up being powerless, that they're um, thrown out of their respective political power, um, parties and uh, they lose all of their influence. And so they, they seem to be old and unthreatening. Um, so that's kind of an interesting portrayal of, of these men. We don't get that with Big Brother who looms um, ominously um, and is um, a very frightening character. Uh, okay, so we'll move on. Oh, here we go. We've got more about demonstrations and what's going on in terms of the collective mobilisation of the people by 1989. And um, we've also got, in contrast to that, um, the continued assertion by the party that um, that people would be persecuted and prosecuted, sorry, they'd be um, rounded up and imprisoned for protesting. So we've got the political reality versus the public demonstration of resistance and clearly the people win out and they're not prosecuted and these old men are shown and exposed as being um, really antiquated and archaic in their thinking, very behind the times. Um, so we've got continued um, references to the um, fall of um, East Germany um, with the Hungarians cutting the barbed wire fence. 
with their border and there's a kind of looming inevitability um, to the fall of communism or socialism or whatever you want to call it because it is in essence um, a quasi form of socialism or communism. Um, it's not um, purely um, ideologically um, a form of government that subscribes to those kinds of thinkings that we understand socialism and um, communism to um, be. Um, which is another really worthwhile point to note that in 1984 we have Big Brother assert that its fundamental principles are INGSOC or English socialism but we don't have actually ever find out what that means. There's principles and the sacred principles of INGSOC um, including new speak, double think, the mutability of the past kind of point to some system of rules and regulations but if you think about it there's really no belief system. We'll come back to that I think because in my opinion these silly old men who run East Germany do have a very passionate belief in um, the principles of socialism and communism. I think that they genuinely think that those ideological um, beliefs are valuable and are important and I think they do hang on to those. Um, whereas in 1984, I, I don't think Ingsoc has a similar set of beliefs. I don't think it is driven by um, some kind of ideological um, underpinning, but rather it's a, systems of, a system of rules and um, regulations um, that keep people in check and, and control people. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so we've got references to the um, gradual decline of Milke and Honecker's power. So you can have a flick through that, see if there's anything there. Um, we've got more about the demonstrations and the, the growing um, discontent of the masses. So again, we've got courage and resistance. And um, this reference to the City of Heroes is a nice one in terms of um, Leipzig and how it comes to be the, the centre of resistance. Um, we've got reference to dates. Again, um, Funda does keep this very factual in terms of tracking historically through the process of um, the GDR's loss of power. Um, we've got a reference to people um, filing out of East Germany and into West Germany and um, that moment of um, the wall coming down, okay, with people crying and dancing on the wall. So that's a nice little image if you want to add that to your um, quote bank um, when you're taking down your notes with courage and resistance. Okay, so we've got that historical documentation that goes on in that chapter as Funda kind of tries to clear her head and get out of the house because these phone calls she keeps getting and pestered by, um, but by the same token she's the one that's put the ad in the paper asking for these people to ring her. So she goes off to the museum, finds out some more information about the party and its leaders and um, the, the gradual um, rise of... Um, of the protesters um, who resist the, um, the party by 1989 and 1990. So then we move to chapter 7. So note chapter headings are important. So as I said about the last chapter, we've got a reference here to old men. So the contrast I think in her language use between old and young or old and new establishes the, um, the um, regime, the East German regime as, as being um, behind the times. So there's some connotations there that really um, portray the men and the true believers of the party as being very much out of touch. Okay, so we're still at the um, headquarters of the Stasi um, in Berlin here 
Um, there's a reference to what happens to Milka um, during the final days of his government and how ridiculous a, a character he becomes. Um, there's an address to Parliament that he makes that he um, is pretty much ridiculed for um, and we see that he has no power anymore. Um, to me, this is an interesting kind of endorsement of the power of the people and the power of democracy to um, triumph over um, totalitarianism. So implicitly, I think there seems to be um, an allusion um, to the fact that um, democracy um, and the power of the people is um, a, a powerful weapon um, that will triumph over um, ideas that are um, antiquated and not beneficial to the people. So we've got references then to what happens when Milka loses his power. We've got some um, prosecution um, about a few crimes that he supposedly um, committed. Um, Honecker similarly um, is accused of um, denying people their freedom and so he is um, to be prosecuted as well. Yet we find out that not a lot happens to these men. Um, in the end they die and that's the end of them. So we see that Honecker dies in 1994 um, after a short illness and we see that um, Milka um, died as well. I'm just trying to find out where it says that. Um, but he, he dies as well. Um, and they don't serve much time, if, it, if any. Okay. Uh, then there's a reference to the Stasi files and, and what's going to happen to them. So we've got this shift in government. We've got power to the people. And so there needs to be a lot of stuff sorted out in terms of um, the GDR, particularly in relation to the collection of data about people. You know, what are they going to do with this? So we find out that the Stasi tried to destroy many of its files, but um, it was only able to um, destroy some of them, not all of them. So um, there are files that were um, retained. And so we see that the East Germans um, wanted to make them available. So they wanted to have freedom of access to these files. So um, after a while, we find out um, that the files are open. Um, let me see where that is. Uh, okay, we've got also a reference to the day of German reunification um, and the day the GDR ceased to exist. The East German pastor took office as head of the newly formed Stasi file authority. And then the German, uh, Germany was the only Eastern Bloc country in the end that so bravely and conscientiously opened its files on its people, um, to its people. So I've got a reference there to the opening of the files and how important that is in a surveillance state that people have that access. Um, so that goes back to those um, women in Nuremberg, the um, puzzle people, or the puzzle women. Um, who attempt to put back this information together and, and to give people a sense of peace and a sense of understanding and knowledge about maybe what's happened to their loved ones or what information was collected about them, that kind of thing. So um, there's an important process of, um, I suppose, rehabilitation or uh, attempting to um, cleanse oneself um, of the past. And so the work of the puzzle women becomes important um, in that regard. Whoops. Okay. So we've got the um, tour group finishes and then we've got um, Funda still at, um, at Stasi HQ. She wants to go and visit Milka's office and so she has a chat to the tour guide 
And then she, um, she goes up the stairs and um, checks it out. So there's some interesting descriptions. Again, she integrates a bit of factual evidence with her own kind of sensory experiences of um, the, the museum itself and what she sees and what she hears and what she feels. So, you know, the reference again to the smell of old men is um, an allusion to the fact that the, the whole office kind of has this smell that won't disappear and it's, it's tainted with the smell of these old dictators. Um, really oppressive and odious. Um, it might be worth remembering also the very evocative smell of Alexander Platt's station at the beginning. There's another allusion here to things being stuck in the past in a minute. I'll talk about um, the um, decor and the furniture that is um, very 1950s, um, which again reinforces that whole sense of being locked in the past. Okay. We've also got um, these figureheads of Marx, so you might want to do some vocab around Marx and Lenin in a minute. You've got Lenin as well. Um, and you might want to look up socialism because that's going to be important in terms of contrasting the political ideology of the GDR with English socialism so that there's some um, fairly important contrasts there in terms of the idea, ideology of um, both parties. Um, so back to these figureheads and, and the busts. So we've got these kind of artefacts that um, remind us of, in many ways, Big Brother as well, and the importance of having a leader. Um, so I guess totalitarianism and control um, is at the heart of um, 1984 in terms of the um, image of Big Brother that appears everywhere. But here we've got Marx and Lenin, which kind of reminds me that there is um, a, a philosophy behind the thinking of Honecker and Milka, um, that, that they're not kind of hiding behind this empty propaganda poster. Um, but rather there is this central belief that they have in the goodness of socialism. Um, that might be just me and you don't have to interpret it in this way, but I just think that the ever-present reference to um, the Communist Manifesto, we'll get that in a little minute, with her wins. That's another thing you might want to look up. So the Communist Manifesto, theories on socialism, a reference to Marx, a reference to Lenin, all of these um, 19th century um, figures are really important historical figures in terms of um, the founders of um, socialism. So to me, um, symbolically, they suggest that these old men had some kind of genuine belief in what it was that they were trying to do. That's not trying to present them in a sympathetic light, but it's attempting, I suppose, to contrast their thinking with the emptiness and the hollowness of English socialism, which doesn't have any kind of tenet or any kind of um, belief system attached to it. It's just this hollow, empty shell, I think. Okay, so um, more descriptions of the room. We've got a reference to Lenin again. So the portrait of Lenin. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? His eyes follow me across the room. So um, the opening page of 1984 has a similar kind of sentence you could use as a comparative um, focus. Um, it's life size and his head seems small compared with um, these other references. So the fact that she's written about this, I think, is important in establishing um, the, the feeling or the vibe of the room as one that um, is attempting to um, establish Milka's beliefs. Now, the other thing I think that's interesting, I'll just go a little bit further up, is the reference to the plasticky noise on the lino um, and the reference to 
the sense you might get visiting someone who bought their furniture as a bride in the 1950s but never had the means to update it. In fact, everything seems to be in that particular 50s yellowy green colour, nuclear mustard. And that reminds me again of Alexander Platt Station. It also reminds me of the Linoleum Palace and, and her description of the um, place that she lives in. Um, we get this whole sense of being somehow locked in a past world, which again goes back to that whole sense of um, the smell of old men. So holding on to things that are old, this refusal to move um, forward, um, which is interesting because clearly um, things have moved, but where um, she's in a museum at the moment and they're trying to preserve those elements of the past that um, demonstrate um, the um, archaic nature of the GDR, um, which until 1989 um, seemed to still be stuck in the 1950s. Okay, we've got some uh, more amateur footage or, or just references to demonstrators again. So um, again, we've got references to the collective actions of the many and how that mobilisation of people through um, public displays of protest was such a crucial component of resistance in Stasiland. Clearly we don't get that in 1984. So um, coupled with the collective display of protest, we've got in Anna Funda's Stasiland references to the individual stories. So um, I think there's a combination of ways that Funda examines the stories of courage and resistance. So the other stories that we'll look at later and that you've already looked at, such as Miriam's story and Julia's story, contrast markedly to the political demonstrations um, and they're very different displays of courage. So that, that's just worth noting, I think. Okay. Okay, we're still in the museum and there's the cleaning woman and um, I think um, Anna Funders um, stays till quite late and in the end has a bit of a conversation with the cleaning lady and um, there's a reference to yeah, the smell of old men and the inability to really um, erase that smell. Um, and it seems to me that that's kind of symbolic of the histories of those who continue to feel the effects of the GDR. So there's some nice links there, I suppose, in terms of totalitarianism and control, because even though the people are now free, they seem to be kind of locked in the past. They seem to be trapped in um, a past that, Strangely, they feel a degree of nostalgia about, um, and there is that word which escapes me now for that feeling of remembering the past in a way that is kind of nostalgic, even though it wasn't very pleasant. So that's kind of a thread that comes through the text that you might want to pick up on, that um, that whole notion of control is so um, hard to arrays that it kind of impregnates the psyches of all of its victims and perpetrators um, and continues on into the present. Um, it's inescapable. Um, so there's lots and lots of references to that and we'll have a look at her wins in a minute as an example of um, this legacy that continues on. Um, okay. So back to the telephone calls and you will note that the chapter on telephone calls is about telephone calls. So um, Anna returning to her home um, finds that there's more calls. She's got a, a phone call from Miriam uh, and she is um, interested in 
finding out what's going on with Miriam because clearly she's sort of um, had a fairly in-depth conversation with her about her life and, and the death of Charlie and um, and the repercussions of um, of that whole um, episode of her life on her um, present. Um, but what she finds is that Miriam, she thinks, is retreating from her. So to me what's going on here is this whole sense of Anna coming to realise that as an interviewer she has some kind of sense of responsibility for what's unfolding in terms of these personal stories she's collecting because um, these people who are burdened by a past that they are trying to kind of put to bed um, find themselves dredging up all this stuff that's really difficult to deal with. So for Miriam, um, there's a need perhaps to distance herself from Anna um, because of the stories that she's told her and, and the repercussions of that on her own personal health and well-being. So Anna is greatly affected by um, the interviews that she has with these people and we find out about this. So in terms of the, um, the style of the text, we get this personalisation here. It's not just this objective interview process. We get Anna as a character at times um, very much immersed in the stories of the people that she's interviewing um, and, and we do see her own personal investment here. Um, Okay, I'm not sure I'd want to see that person again either, especially if my life had been written down by people stolen and steered. She's taking moral responsibility um, for what she's done to Miriam. So she acknowledges that the story needs to be told, but by the same token, um, there's a cost um, associated with telling this story um, in terms of um, what it does to Miriam. Okay, um, there's more phone calls. Uh, before the phone call, though, um, she has this weird dream. Um, she's Her um, mattress she pulls up next to the heater and she ends up going to sleep watching um, television. Um, so clearly that's another indication that she's being really affected by the stories that she's recounting and, and um, finding out about. Um, so she has this really weird dream. So again, I think that that's just reflective of the fact that she's in some ways traumatised by what's going on. Um, okay, we've got another phone call and here it's old Klaus. So um, Klaus makes a bit of a cameo appearance here. He has a chapter all to himself down the track. He's a muso and he, and he is somebody that we learn will be the focus of um, um, one of Anna's um, stories down the track in terms of his resistance um, to the regime. But that's enough of him. He's just a drinking partner. Not just, but um, that's his role at the moment um, in this chapter. Okay, so then we have another phone call and this time it's from this character called Her Wins. So she takes the call and it's all a bit weird. Um, I think what she's attempting to do here in setting up um, the character of Her Wins is to expose him as being a little bit ridiculous and farcical, kind of in the same way as maybe Milka and Honika, um, but, you know, this guy's alive and he's actually talking to her so she can kind of, um, regurgitate parts of the discussion or the conversation she has with him on the phone and what we find out is that he's very interrogative in his manner of questioning so she kind of sets that up um, to show that he's this character that's very very suspicious so in terms of themes I think it's interesting to note that um, both in terms of victims and perpetrators, there's this kind of defining quality of untrustworthiness that I think is another residual legacy of the GDR and the 
surveillance state. So you can kind of talk about that in terms of totalitarianism and control and um, also surveillance, I think. So let's have a look at a few of the things that he says to her. He asks her for her identity card. He designates where he wants to meet and why. Even the manner of his dress is interesting in terms of it kind of being a weird disguise. He's kind of um, dressed as a Westerner. I'm just trying to find the reference here. Um, Okay, I'm incredulous that this man wants to play spy games seven years after the fall of the war. So um, she's kind of, um, in many ways, um, mocking her wins. Um, I'm just trying to find the, the little bit about the way that he's dressed. Um, All right, here he says one cannot be too careful these days. So that's another allusion to the fact that he um, is very conscious of who he talks to, who might be listening to his conversation, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so once he's established that she's somebody that he can talk to, he starts to confide in her. Um, she becomes suspicious about his story um, and she kind of doubts his claims that he is this counter espionage character. She doesn't think that he um, has the kind of credentials that he claims that he does. So um, she kind of discredits him in that regard. Um, I'll try and find that in a minute. Um, we've got another reference here to... Um, socialism and Karl Marx um, and Engels, the Communist Manifesto. So um, we've just had that earlier reference in Milka's office to the bust of Lenin and the reference to Marx. So we can see that um, permeating this landscape are these kind of ideological allusions to socialism. Um, and there is this kind of horror romance. Remember, she speaks in Chapter 1, I think it is, about the GDR being a kind of horror romance, um, a romance because of the ideals that were held um, at when um, the party came to power, but then the horror um, is associated with what ended up happening. So we've got that kind of contrast between idealism versus reality. So idealism is manifest in... Karl Marx and Engels' um, little book, The Communist Manifesto, which wins clearly regards as a bit of a, um, a Bible, um, and, and he kind of advises her to read it for Anna to um, become familiar with it, um, and, and that's a diversion. So Anna wants to talk about his work as um, this counter-espionage spy, but he just wants to talk about socialism. So... Um, He's a very difficult person to interview in this regard. Um, we've got a reference to his nostalgia again um, and his desire to have his version of events um, told. So he's a member of this kind of committee called the Insider Committee, um, which, you know, euphemistically is also known as the Civil Rights and Dignity of Man. Um, the Society for the Protection of Civil Rights and the Digni Dignity of Man, sorry, um, where they, these guys um, who feel, feel that they are victims, and this is interesting as well, um, that these um, people who were, um, were perpetrators actually now see themselves as, as being victims. Um, so they go about writing their story and trying to correct the wrongs that they feel are being said about them. Um, so he kind of talks a bit about that. Um, yeah, here's an example. We try to present an objective view of history, he says, um, to combat the lies and misrepresentation in the Western media. So we've got that reference to propaganda um, too, which is interesting. Uh, here's the reference to the counter-espionage and... 
um, you know, his assertion, I'm here to tell you about the excellent work, the masterful work of the Stasi and counter-espionage. That is where I spent my life. Um, again, we've got funders hunched that, you know, that's a heap of BS. Um, so he doesn't seem like a very scary or um, formidable character. Um, he goes on about the propaganda that's used against him. So we've got in her Windsor's um, interview here a reference to the fact that these, these um, party faithful refuse to believe the new reality. So there is this continued push for um, the old ideas and the old ideologies. So um, that's something that continues for a lot of these people. This capital, capitalism is above all exploitation. It's unfair. It's brutal. The rich getting richer, um, the poor getting um, steadily poorer, and capitalism makes war. So um, ideologically, um, you know, he's kind of mouthing and echoing um, the, the thinking um, that he has, um, which um, the socialists, such as Marx and Engels, um, declare in, in the Communist Manifesto. So um, he's appropriating this party rhetoric and my argument is that in 1984 we don't get such beliefs with English socialism. Um, we've got a reference to German imperialism. Um, each industrialist is a criminal at war with the other, etc. So, you know, he does, I think, genuinely have this concern for... Um, the poor and um, some concern um, concerns about um, German imperialism, but I think Funder mocks him um, because she's very much on the side of democracy. So again, I think that really emphasises her bias, her own subjectivity in terms of um, taking the piss a little bit um, in regards to characters such as her wins, who seem farcical and irrelevant. They they seem not to have a place in her mind um, in um, an advanced and progressive democratic democratic world. Um, we've got more references here to his kind of claims about capitalism, etc. And you know, in my opinion, his claims aren't so bad, but she um, clearly um, discredits him in her mocking tone. Um, this man is dis um, disguised as a Westerner, the better to fit unnoticed into the world he finds himself in. But the more he talks, the clearer it becomes that he is undercover, waiting for the second coming of socialism. Um, that's a nice quote. Okay, what else? Um, again, we've got references to his insistence that as Thunder says, um, the second wave of communism is coming. You know, he, he really believes that um, capitalism is doomed and um, that there will be um, the next wave of communism. Okay, more phone calls. Um, as Miriam, as Anna tries to reconnect with Miriam, but there's no luck there, and we kind of suspect that Miriam is going to do a disappearing act um, and that's going to leave Anna um, hanging because, you know, clearly these vivid dreams that she's had um, about um, a range of things point to a, a sense of um, guilt that she has, that there, there is no closure in the story of Miriam and, you know, she's opened up this can of worms. Um, so it'll be really important to consider at the end of the, the book um, the way that she closes with M Miriam's story a couple of years down the track um, because Miriam clearly is, is going into hiding and, and doesn't want to have anything to do with Funda. So that becomes um, really a story of how Funda can cope with um, what it is that she has initiated, essentially. Um, we're not going to cover Julia Has No Story. I think it doesn't really fit here. So even though it's part of your reading for the week, um, I'm going to leave this and you'll be sick of this anyway. Okay, I hope that's been of some use and happy note taking. <laughs>